Hey guys, welcome to Found Flicks. Hope you aren't suffering too bad from Stephen King withdrawals because it's been a whole month since we've had a new King movie adaptation. I know, can you believe it? That is so long. This time, it's a novella co-written with his son expanded into a Netflix movie, In the Tall Grass, where a brother and sister enter into a field of tall grass to rescue a boy, but soon realize they cannot escape and something evil lurks in the grass. When I saw the trailer for this one, seeing that the grass itself was evil in some way, I'm like, oh boy, how many things can Stephen King make us scared of? Tall grass for God's sakes. So that's why I kept calling the movie Bad Grass in my head, which is definitely appropriate for what goes down in the story. And could also already tell that Patrick Wilson with his tiny mustache is definitely bad news. I was like, he's gonna be the bad guy. It's also worth pointing out this comes from writer-director Vincenzo Natale of the original Cube, which makes a lot of sense. Instead of people being trapped in a cube, they're trapped in bad grass. Kind of the same thing. However, the story still did go in a, some quite out there directions, becoming much more esoteric than I would have anticipated. Which was surprising as a huge majority of the movie is literally just people wandering around a field yelling for someone else. Cow? Becky, I can't find you! But ultimately evolves into something more interesting and complex than I expected, taking on some grander religious connotations as well, involving the idea of redemption. So with all that in mind, let's venture in the tall grass, breaking down the odd properties of the area, including how reality and time are affected, the big ancient rock that appears responsible for all the strangeness, as well as explaining the time loop breaking headache of an ending. The sun shines down on a country road in the middle of of nowhere in Kansas. Siblings Cal and very pregnant Becky are on their way to San Diego. Becky has found herself unready to be a mother and is driving to the west coast to sort out the details, but is continuing to suffer from morning sickness. Cal forced to pull over on the side of the road so she can retch. Just about to get back on the road, they hear a young boy's voice calling to them from amongst a field of quite tall grass nearby. He says he's lost in there, asking for their help, and they agree to go in after him, first parking their car at an abandoned in church across the road. Standing right on the verge of the field, the boy says he's been stuck in there for days, and it sounds like he's right next to them. Cal reactively walking into the grass, thinking it'll be no big deal to get the kid and get out. How wrong you are, my friend, because this ain't your average grass. Becky hesitates for a moment until entering herself, following after her brother. She attempts to call 911, but the signal is spotty and soon cuts out into static. Things suddenly get quiet, and now they're getting no answer back from the child when yelling for him. Cal instructs him to stay in the same place and they'll come to him, first having to find Becky. She stays in place, spouting off several vulgar rhymes, Cal trying to follow her voice. But the direction seems to change, at one point thinking he walked right past her, as her voice is now coming from somewhere else entirely, our first sign that reality cannot be trusted amongst the tall grass, which undoubtedly would want to make them stay and never get out, making it as difficult as possible to do so. This bending of space becomes much clearer when they both jump at the same time. And they're pretty close. And yet when doing it again, they look to be in entirely different positions, much further away than seconds ago. Well, that's definitely not how time and space are supposed to work. The day winding down, they still haven't found each other. But Becky does make a new friend, a man busting through the grass, Ross, who claims to be Tobin's dad, saying he's looking for his wife and son, promising that he knows the way out. Well, I sure wouldn't trust this guy based on first impressions, even his tiny little mother. Mustache. I'd be like, this guy is probably secretly nuts and is leading me to my death. But what better option does Becky have at the moment? Deciding to trust Ross and stick together. Elsewhere, a desperate Cal gives up, falling to his knees, and meets his own new grass friend, the little boy Tobin. I'd be like, this whole thing is your fault, you little shit! He doesn't do himself any favors here, acting like a total creep, mumbling about how he can find things here easier when they're dead. That the field doesn't move dead things around. Well, that's good to know. Cal does at least ask if he lured them in here, but he assures him that he did it, saying he heard someone, a man calling for help, and this is what caused his family to enter the grass and get stuck. Well, that's all well and good, but Tobin has more troubling information, telling him Becky is going to die soon. He's like, uh, how do you know my sister? And the boy tells him it's thanks to the rock, and that it teaches you to listen to the tall grass, because the tall grass knows everything. Sure, always listen to the big rock and the grass. They, they know the score. What the hell are you talking about, kid? 
Regardless of this kid being crazy, Cal is hopeful that he can help him find Becky. Tobin saying he can show him where she is, getting him to follow after. And it appears that creepy Tobin was correct about Becky's fate, her seen walking with Ross. Talk turns to her unborn child, but things get a little awkward as the father isn't in the picture. Too bad for him, Ross says, calling family everything. Yeah, this guy's nuts, right? On the ground, Becky spots a spilled out first aid kit, seeing scissors, prescriptions, along with blood and hair. She looks up and Ross is gone. What else to do now but go back to uselessly calling her brother's name? A person leaping out of the grass and lunging for her. It's hard to make out who the person is, but it's a frightened and wounded Natalie, Tobin's mom, that appears. Now we don't actually see Becky get killed, but I would assume it was Ross sometime later that did the deed. I don't think it was Natalie. Cal, unaware of his sister's attack, comes to where Tobin was taking him. An actual big rock in the middle of the field. Oh, well, I guess he wasn't lying about that. With some obviously ritualistic carvings adorning it. In a small radius around the rock, there is no grass. Clearly, this is what is responsible for the odd reality of the area, and this is the center of the grass labyrinth that makes up the field. Tobin casually puts his hand on it, describing touching it as feeling good, encouraging Cal to touch it for himself. Yeah, sure, buddy, touch my giant ancient rock. It's a blast. Jeez. But he goes for it, reaching out towards it, the wind getting higher, the moon cresting the tip of the rock. He's stopped by the sound of his sister screaming in terror. He runs off after the sound, Tobin begrudgingly telling him he's too late, and will never find her that way, seeing Cal make a straight beeline forward through the field, which looks like it would just go on forever and ever, no end in sight to the grass. And indeed, he never actually finds her, as we move on to some time later with another person being drawn into the field. It's Becky's baby daddy, Travis, who pulls over at a gas station asking about the sibling's whereabouts. Down the road a ways, he comes to the same church they pulled over at. And how about the fact that the church is named after the Black Rock of the Redeemer? Hmm, almost looks like there is some kind of actual organized religion related to worshiping the nearby big rock. But where did all the people go? Oh right, probably trapped in the field for eternity. And it looks like there's even more cars now beyond theirs, which Travis is shocked to find. Also, based on the state of the leftover burger in the car, it's been quite a while that they've been missing. Finding a copy of Jane Eyre on the ground, Becky's name is scribbled inside. Enough evidence for him to set off into the tall grass. Oh boy, here we go again. He does at least tie up the grass as he passes by to mark where he's been, but naturally the grass unties itself right after. After. Dang, tricky grass. He's given more difficulties traveling using the sun as a guide. Travis obviously having some kind of basic survival skills, but when rechecking the sky, the sun's position has moved, making it impossible to track where he's actually going. Night falls and he too finds himself stuck in the grass, visited by little Tobin who tells him to listen, hearing laughing and weird growling amongst the wind, saying that's everyone else, the others stuck here. But as they're not connected to them, it doesn't matter. This reveals that they're most likely far are more people in the grass outside of this group, all having their own connected kind of loop of interaction. And Toby is somehow connected to them, knowing both Travis's name and that he's looking for Becky. Hearing her name alone is enough for Travis to get serious with the boy, shaking him and demanding to know where she is. He, just as with Cal, offers to show him. He does actually take him to Becky, but it's unfortunately her dead body. As Tobin said earlier, dead things don't move in the grass, so he was able to more easily find her, thanks to her being dead. Travis breaks down at the sight of seeing her body, and suddenly Tobin is gone. The next morning, there's a pretty cool shot following a drop of rain flowing down a reed and down onto Travis's eye, waking him up, still next to Becky's body. He retrieves a necklace before continuing onwards, soon hearing a woman's voice saying they don't know where the car is, obviously Natalie, Tobin's mom, hearing the entire family chattering, seeing this is actually before they came into the grass. And it turns out to be Travis's voice that sent them inside in the first place. The family dog, Freddy, seen dead earlier, is now alive, and he runs into the grass, followed by Tobin and then his annoyed parents. So what's the deal here? It appears that the radius of the grass field is caught in a kind of independent time loop that resets each day. It's also independent of time outside, acting on its own realm of reality as we know. Thusly, things can occur like Travis bringing the family in because their arrival is based on outside time, not the grass's time loop. They encounter the same issues as Becky and Cal before unable to ever actually find Travis despite following his voice. It changes directions, and they all end up getting separated, speeding quickly through to nighttime, where Ross is still searching for his family, stumbling upon something 
else entirely. The same rock that Tobin wanted Cal to touch. Most likely not a good idea. He seems overwhelmed in its presence, slowly approaching it and obviously touches it himself, even though we cut away to the next morning before this moment. We then return to the siblings back when first entering and searching for Tobin. With the days reset, so too is their journey. So while one Becky was killed, if anyone is killed, a new day will bring another one of them into the ever-expanding loop, which now has a new component with Travis joining them in the grass, who now overhears Becky reciting her dirty limericks. And the two call back to each other, surprised that he's in here too. Travis explains that he came looking for her, and using poor Freddy's body as a waypoint, they are able to all reunite by following Tobin's voice. Nice work, guys! Though I imagine the field still only let this happen rather than them really accomplishing anything here. Things are awkward between Becky and Travis since he did want her to get rid of the baby and everything, plus her being dead before to boot. Again, asking how he came here. To her, they left merely two days ago, but Travis reveals it's been more like two months, which is pretty insane to consider. Already how many times they've relived the same day's journey until now. Getting Tobin on his shoulders, they spot a building in the distance and decide to head after it. Of course, Travis didn't call anyone before coming in, so it appears that no one else will be coming to help them. Becky correcting him that he did. The baby kicks, and despite her being on the trip to hand the baby off, she seems more invested now in her maternal role, even letting Travis feel their baby move in her belly. Maybe there is some love left between these two. Fingers crossed these crazy kids can work it out, y'all. Strangely, Cal's phone begins to ring, despite not seeming to work earlier. A woman's voice heard on the other side, which through the static sounds to be Becky herself, who warns her, self to not let Cal hurt Travis. If this happens, they're going to keep making the same mistake, then hearing her screaming and the call cuts off. Hmm. Well, that's definitely weird, since she was able to call herself, as though there are actually infinite multiple realities occurring at the same time. Seems like anything space and time-wise is fair game in this crazy grass. The rock then chooses to fill Becky's head with strange visions, the leaves beginning to chuckle, the sky turning blood red. In her womb, leaves almost entangle the fetus inside, seeing the ground itself is breathing, glimpsing drawings from the side of the rock in more detail, and a quick flash of someone in a weird twig crown. Now we understand that the grass and its inhabitants have a desire to get Becky's unborn child. The others run to her aid, joined by an out-of-nowhere-as-usual Ross, who does CPR and quite easily brings her back. Oh, and reuniting with his boy as well. Ross is somehow sure Becky and all of them are going to be just fine as he got to the road, but vows that he's not going to be leaving without his family. They divulge their excellent plan of heading towards that building, and surprise, surprise, when lifting Tobin up again, the building is nowhere to be found. Ross laments that's just how things work around here, offering that he has the golden ticket for any takers. But rather than actually lead them out, he takes them to the big rock and Ross is clearly enchanted by its odd powers. He considers its age, and that it must be ancient, here long before the glaciers melted, then carried down the hills of the United States, noting that it's smack dab at the center of the US, at the center of the center, the placement itself having some significance indicating as to why this rock is in the middle of rural Kansas in the first place. Becky is irritated, as he was supposed to show them the way out, but he maintains that he has. All you gotta do is put a hand on that big rock, and you'll know. Cal again seems more than happy to touch this ancient evil rock, but is stopped once again, this time by the wayward Natalie, who warns them to stay away from Ross, and is frightened seeing Becky now, having recently seen her dead body earlier. But Ross diverts things away, saying mommy's just confused. I don't think so, pal, as another random vision casts further doubts on Ross's character. Him seen with wide eyes, looking all crazed, the grass beginning to envelop all around him. So yeah, with his odd behavior, they're ready to head out on their own. But Ross is like, you guys really gotta touch this thing. He's a big fan of the rock, if you couldn't tell. Saying it was its wisdom that brought them together. Saying they're here for a reason, and that touching the rock offers them redemption. Everyone is like, uh, you talking crazy, Patrick Wilson. They're not interested in what he's selling. So Ross offers them the hard sell. Travis lunging at him, giving the siblings a chance to escape. Ross then turns his attention to his darling wife, putting his hands on the sides of her head and crushing it, gravely stating that all flesh is grass. Yep, he He's totally lost it, just like we knew from the beginning, right folks? Stumbling across a still-alive Freddy, they're able to follow him out of the grass. I know, what? And take refuge in an abandoned bowling alley. Tobin agrees with his father's sentiment about us being grass, as we keep dying and coming back, a kind of circle of life thing. Again, expressing the endless loop they're trapped in where death is never final. Things get heated between Cal and Travis, beginning to finally bubble to the
the surface about him not wanting the baby. And Travis admits to his mistake, but Cal exposes his fault that he cares perhaps a bit too much about his sister, you know, in an unhealthy way, like he's in love with her, you know, not just in love with her, saying that no one would ever be good enough for his sister. This accusation leads to a brawl between the two, interrupted by a cheerful Ross at the door informing them that redemption is here, everyone scurrying up to the roof. Up there, they can see the church, with only one thing standing between them. Oh right, the evil grass. Or perhaps there's another way. Seeing Freddy down below, who vanishes behind a patch of grass and emerges on the other side of the road right by the church, realizing there's a hole of some kind that they could use as well to circumvent the ever-changing fields. But fate has other plans, Travis slipping off the roof and grabbed by Cal, who, as indistinct whispers start to take over, lets him go, Travis thudding to the ground below. He tries to come up with an excuse, but Ross has made it up, and outside, Becky tries to confront him about what happened, Cal only saying to forget that asshole and that he loves her, definitely looking like Travis's accusation was founded after all. Ross again catches up to them grabbing Cal and begins to strangle him out, goading him for thinking he was ever leaving, the shot pulling out and seeing several other dead cows there in various states of decomposition, showing us the same unfortunate scenario has played out the same way multiple times already. Travis and Becky come to later near each other in the grass, and he again admits that this is his own fault, that he had his chance with her and threw it all away, while Becky also admits that she thought she wasn't ready to be a mother, but her feelings have changed, and Travis vows to get them out of here for the sake of their baby's life. He reaches out, and Ross is back, grabbing her away and attempts to sexually assault her, which is very uncomfortable, asking if she wants to lie on the rock naked while the grass sings her name. Tempting, but no. Becky jamming scissors from the first aid kit into his eye socket, and she flees as a rainstorm begins to roll into the field. Stopped in pain, she glimpses people that appear in the lightning, emerging from the grass, and surrounding her accompanied by odd chanting, the group lifting her up and passing her down a line. Seeing the whole field is breathing in a sense, the chanting stopping as she's placed on the ground at the foot of the rock, of course. Now is when she decides is the perfect opportunity to call Cal in the past. Still not sure exactly how all this would work, beyond the multiple realities at once thing, and even then, the call literally has no impact on what happened. Her then yowling in pain as the call cuts out. We see more drawings now on the rock, including people carrying someone just like they did with Becky, and another featuring what looks like a baby plopping out of someone, then it being held in the air with a stick through it or something, all this making it seem like what the rock is really after is some fresh babies. I mean, these drawings are all over the dang thing, what else could that mean? It does feed into the whole cyclical nature of the grass, the new life on the verge of being brought into the world. The ground then starts to swell, ripping open and exposing underneath the rock, filled with the many, many souls that it has trapped over time, all now a part of the grass forever. Becky attempts to crawl away, but the pain is too much. Lightning flashes, and she later regains consciousness. What appears to be Cal is there, calling her the Mother Mary, then waking her up again with weird limericks about sowing seeds and grass coming out of your ass. And he's feeding her something, Becky gratefully chopping it down. She asks what it is, being told, it's just grass, seeds, and so on. Don't worry, cows do it all the time. He hands her another piece, deeming it good for her soul. And we discover it's not Cal, but Ross that is there. And yep, he's been feeding her her baby. Pretty fucked up stuff going on in this grass. We then catch up to Travis, futilely running through the field, finding himself at the rock. Becky is still there, unmoving and mumbling about the baby. And there's no heartbeat when he checks for a pulse. Tobin steps in, distraught that this will never stop. His daddy is gonna keep killing them over and over again. Travis is sick of it, taunting Ross to come and finish them off, who appears behind them, pushing him into the mud. Ross grabs a pointy bone, disappointed in Travis, saying all he ever wanted was to give him redemption, pointing out that he needed it the most. Ah oh well, maybe next time, he shrugs, stabbing the bone deep into his stomach. He then grabs his son, attempting to force him to touch the glorious rock. In this incarnation, Tobin has obviously yet to touch it. And this is the moment it must happen in all other incarnations of the day, which is halted by Becky getting him in the other eye. Ross now completely blind, flailing his limbs around in the air uselessly. Travis smashes his head onto his favorite rock, the two continuing to struggle in the mud. The grass grows restless, several strands coming out of the ground and wrapping around Ross's neck, chanting getting louder and louder as Travis chokes Ross out, but poor Becky is lost too, having perished from her trauma. No other options, Travis decides he has to touch the rock, Tobin reminding him that if he touches it, he won't ever leave, but he does so anyway, the red sky taking over, grass growing over his hand and then going into his heart, the rock itself seen breathing, as if it is in some way a living being, and now Travis, like countless others before, is bound to the rock and its limited boundaries of the fields. Red lines spread from its radius 
into the entire field, and Travis removes his hand. Tobin appears concerned that he will turn murderous like his pops, but not for Travis, instructing Tobin to follow him, taking him to that hole that they saw Freddy use earlier. He knows he can't leave, but hands him Becky's necklace, knowing that he can now save Tobin and Becky, placing him in a room earlier in the day according to outside time. This is actually thanks to the rock's powers. Ross wasn't lying that touching it reveals everything about the fields, and in a way, one can communicate with the grass. And this allowed Travis to take advantage of how things work here, positioning this Tobit exactly where he needs him, which is in a room at the roadside church, back to that morning. If not the same door, it's at least another reality rip from the grass zone to our world. The Church of the Black Rock have this entire odd room constructed here, and they too must have at some point encountered the hole to even create this room around it. He steps outside at the moment Cal and Becky are discussing going in to help Tobin. Things are getting a little complicated here, even hearing his voice in the grass. Tobin runs over, telling them not to go in there, which is confusing still hearing him in the grass calling for help. It's thanks to the necklace that they believe him, and feeling that something isn't right, decide it's time to leave, effectively breaking the loop and saving at least Cal, Becky, and her baby, which she decides to keep, along with little Tobin. We then pan back to the field, where Travis is looking much worse for wear, his smile crossing his face as he falls to the ground, looking to the sky as he dies, the grass coming to cover his body. It's funny because for Travis, the rock did provide redemption as Ross promised it would. It was thanks to gaining the knowledge from the rock that he was able to escape the grass and redeem himself. There also seems to be something about how those that touch the rock use their new powers. It obviously corrupted Ross, who he saw was a sleazy real estate agent, and with the rock's knowledge, turned him into a crazed murderer. Not the same outcome with Travis as we saw. This might mean the rock isn't inherently evil, but it all depends on who actually touches it. Travis was admittedly a pretty bad guy, wanting Becky to get an abortion and what have you, yet in the end, thanks to his sacrifice, he was able to save Becky and their daughter from an endless loop of misery and countless deaths. So good for him. And as we know, even though he's dead at the moment, he will come back tomorrow all over again and could potentially help others who find themselves lost in the grass. This brings us to the conclusion of this inning explained on In the Tall Grass. While definitely not the best of Stephen King's massive number of adaptations, it was still pretty decent for a Netflix movie and was adequate enough to fill 90 minutes and hold up interest, even if it did get a little sloppy and, well, boring at points. I know, that's it for this Stephen King adaptation, but don't worry folks because we don't have to wait too long until yet another King adaptation hits the big screen next month with Dr. Sleep. That's right, the King train ain't ever slowing down, and we've all got a one-way ticket to terror. All aboard, baby! What did you guys think of In the Tall Grass? Where do you rank it amongst the many Stephen King movie adaptations? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Thonflix, see you next time, and stay spooky!